many times you arrive at a point, um, some locations, and you just uh, say, wow, what a place, and what brought me here, and this is awesome. And you, you come out with many of these words. You're overwhelmed. You're wondering, like, how did this happen? Why did this not happen before? And you uh, you turn around. You you want to really understand what's going on. You take another look, and uh, and then you sort of ask yourself uh, about uh, situations, these kind of uh, journeys. Like, what if there was another way uh, I could make it to this point? Is it because I have come here? Uh, by coincidence, or is it sometimes I just came here by mistake, but this was a lovely place? Or do you think that, you know, you, you actually decided to be here? Because you feel that, you know, you, you have a sense of accomplishment uh, that brought you there, you could afford to be there, that became your advantage. And it was not really a mistake, but it turns out to be your stake. And that is what is uh, my talk going to be about. How do we identify our own stakes of what we are doing today? Uh, how do we see our present? Is it because of our past experiences? Or uh, how are we looking at the future? Since there are a lot of students here, I think it will be good to talk about future uh, more importantly. Um, so. These kind of uh, situations, what I sh showed you earlier, arriving at a point, it happens sometimes that you know you are going in the train um, or a bus, and you just happen to see a place. You take a picture, and uh, you're just looking, and you're you just like the frame. You take a picture, and and after a few days, you arrive at the same point, and you are still standing with your camera, and then you again take a picture. And these are very moving sort of images that you wonder, is it a coincidence that I'm looking at it again? And then you start observing. Typically, the way we do it in, in our visual observation, that we, we start experiencing even further and further and trying to see different seasons. And these experiences actually extend beyond just that location. We start seeing other places which uh, talk about uh, almost a similar visual extension, or there is there's some variation because the season has changed, but you're looking at the same kind of horizon. And some nights you, you arrive while walking to a, to a point where you say, wow, look at the colors and look at these, uh, these beautiful settings. I wonder what brought me here. And you, probably the previous week also, you said the same thing, uh, arriving at similar locations. And then in the next week, again, you find similar or more interesting things. And, and you start wondering and start visualizing yourself, whether you were, what was it, is it a deja vu or is it something uh, else happening? You're trying to observe more and then you're trying to look at more locations um, which give you similar pleasure and you, you go on and on. And then season changes, you start walking on frozen rivers, you, you start looking at the same fields from above, from the aircraft, and you start looking at shapes and you start looking at lines as if they've been sketched by hand. And, and this goes on, seasons keep changing, textures keep coming, um, the nights start becoming beautiful, you start seeing aurora borealis and, and you are just experiencing uh, different elements of your, um, you know, everyday visual um, uh, exposures. And, and this kind of feeling continues uh, and continues and it only gets better and better every day. But I just wonder again, like, if there's another way, or are we doing something to arrive at these points? Uh, are we really uh, deciding to be there at that time or is it happening by coincidence or is it happening because we are designers or we don't have to be designers to look at these images so it's it's quite important for for us to understand uh, what is what is this location doing to us 
and you start wondering whether you're making some mistake here or it's really your advantage that you are trying to define your current location and you're, you're trying to figure out uh, maybe if I was in another country, I would have done this differently, but all the pictures I showed you are of Sweden, uh, of north of Sweden and south of Sweden, but mostly um, very much from where I live and where I can easily get out, drive or walk. Uh, so the, the story begins like this, that what would best define me as a person in my current location? So until last year in, in March, I was calling myself and I'm a person who travels to work. I would fly in, I live in the north of Sweden in Umeå and I work in Lund, uh, which is very close to Malmo and Copenhagen. And I would uh, continue doing this uh, uh, and I would get all my energy. I'll, uh, I'll look at the, the airplane window as my, my long view. I will plan the courses which I have to do for the, before I arrive at my building. And I would really wonder like, maybe it's also like, like the, I, I love the working environment. This is where I work. And then I get reminded about one of the keynotes I once watched of Ken Robinson. And he said that, you know, in colleges, we don't really teach students. We, we actually provide conditions under which learners or the students begin to flourish. And he also says the same, like we don't really grow plants in the pots. We actually create conditions for the plants to grow uh, very well. So I, it kind of stayed embedded in my mind for a very long time. And, and that also kind of became my stake too, that you know, your learning environment can also work with you as a, as a starting point or your advantage point. So this is the school where I studied, National Institute of Design in India, um, the building, probably indirectly, visually, it was embedding so many uh, qualities, so many new uh, uh, layers um, and parameters into me that I, I probably did not realize it for many years uh, that what was uh, our learning environments doing it, apart from doing the, uh, just the teaching, moving with friends, looking at um, peacocks, looking at the greenery in, in, on the campus. So this is a picture from 98, I had just graduated, but still working there. And back then, I used to think this was my creative process that uh, you, you come up, you evolve the ideas, you come out with the uh, quick sketch models, then you go, um, you, you discuss with clients, you rebrief, you, you refine them, make prototypes and you hand over. So this is what life was like that. And this is what it was giving me at that time very run of the mill pro products. Um, th these products was, were soon coming out in the market, becoming bestsellers. I was getting famous, money was coming in. But then this probably pro brought a lot of questions that what do I do next? And the creative process needs to be uh, enhanced somehow uh, to look at the next level. And then I figured out that the products apart from going through a regular creative process need to be enhanced and they have to be enriched uh, in various ways. And, uh, and they have to be, they have to enable many other things. And, and this is something which probably I would have uh, felt 15 years ago, but I never really realized that new professions are going to be born, which will be called AI, which will be called UX. But these, these questions were still coming in. And uh, then, I, then I just felt that, you know, if we keep going further, we, we need to understand that this whole creative circle you have, it is not only about evolving and, and refining products, it is a lot about uh, enhancing their capabilities and also thinking, thinking about the user, what can we do? We can, we can involve so many different kinds of users, we can make our products exclusive, um, we can understand how the users feel. So this continued with some questions around me, like what are designers doing today and, and what could we be done uh, tomorrow? And what would be their different roles uh, if we keep thinking about it? And also there's a huge challenge coming for all of us today that everyone claims to be a designer. You just learn a few tools and there you are and you, you get jobs and you're competing with people who've done like shorter courses. So you have to really 
understand how do you become a bit exclusive. So in this personal journey, what also happened at that time was I, I came out around these turning points. So I was called by a company to define their, uh, you know, the, the identity of their bicycles to come for the, for the next five years. And this was a very different sort of a project that where we really didn't have to deliver a product to be manufactured, we, but we had to create a product which would be used as a reference for the designers and the design teams to follow it as their DNA. So this was a, um, a good shift in my, my working style. And then on the side, another very interesting thing happened that I was called in to work with a, with a project uh, which was um, more like an architectural museum design project. So this building was designed by a very famous Israeli American architect, Moshe Safdi. I got a chance to meet him, work with his team. And I, I got to the, to the, a very different dimension of working with uh, different designers, architects, filmmakers, and uh, working with the narrative. So the whole idea of the product turned into a narrative for me. So I'll give you a glimpse of this. So um, this particular project gave me the opportunity to work with uh, so many different materials, so many uh, different technologies, bringing in the, the handicrafts of India, which is like a, there's an abundance of talent and skills over there. And also this uh, allowed me uh, another role where I was uh, first uh, designer of the main team and then I also acted as a, a studio head for some time. So I could lead a team of different designers. I could understand what the chief visualizer wants, uh, what, how the various designers are looking at their things, what needs to be done. So, so it gave me um, a complete new outlook to look at um, design. And probably at this time, I stopped looking at industrial design as an area. I started looking at design as a whole. So, so then, Based on this, I thought probably I have to change my attitude. I have to look at different uh, possibilities and then uh, probably question what are the new boundaries being defined. And uh, around the time when this project was happening, I got uh, um, uh, you know, uh, invited by Umiya Institute of Design to work with them. Uh, and in 2005, I just stopped whatever I was doing in India and I moved to Umeo. 
and uh, started becoming more informed, more motivated to do things in a very different culture, shared my knowledge. And I arrive at, uh, at another environment, uh, which I'll give you a glimpse of. When I came into this journey, I was uh, trying to figure out what is my role in education. And I wasn't really calling myself a teacher. I was always saying that I'm a, I'm a designer in education. And uh, all the experiences which I would have learned in museum design and car industry and um, medical products, I brought all of them into the studio here. And it was uh, also for me a great learning experience working with people from 25 to 30 different countries. Um, they were super talented and then also trying to figure out to rediscover yourself to, to offer something which was uh, very new, very experimental, doing, uh, playing with sound and products at the same time and bringing in water looking at uh, air and, and lighting. So a lot of new experiences started coming in and also defining what could uh, vehicles of future look like. But then suddenly, not suddenly, but about three, four years after, I get an offer to become a professor at uh, Lund University. And I, I just say yes to that offer. And I start traveling from north to south. Um, Either I could have said I can stay in one place or I could say that I could probably by traveling a little further, it will open new options for me. I'll get to meet another set of people within the same country. And, and that was the fact that I met, I got a chance to work with a whole new team and to continue spreading my, uh, uh, my knowledge, my, uh, my enthusiasm with, with another team and creating uh, more experiencing this is, and this is how uh, when the things were normal this is how you know a studio would look like uh, with, with all the experiences materials uh, students playing and uh, uh, experimenting with different materials and then we were working a lot with users and trying to understand how to define uh, the future of interactive products and experiences so uh, so a lot of things uh, continue to to go on from, from this point. So, uh, and then also there was a reverse process happening. So there were some students who were learning from our uh, education and then they were setting up their own companies. So there's this, this particular student who learns to, uh, uh, from, from one of the projects, understand how to use the uh, water purification technology, what NASA is using. He uh, brings it, uh, the knowledge with him and sets up his own company. So he makes like a shower uh, where you can use majority of the, the water which goes into the drain, it purifies, it comes back. So you can actually manage to keep bathing with about 15 liters of uh, water, which was surprising. And now this person is, uh, has set up a company, he's, he's making that. There was another similar project which happened in the in the school, very inspiring, uh, which was about uh, how this whole uh, helmet uh, comes about from inspired from an airbag, but it is like so innovative that you know we as teachers get inspired by our students. Uh, Pontus was yet another student who was uh, uh, trying to work with the sustainable packaging, food packaging, and comes out with a with a altogether new material uh, through his experiments uh, while working very closely with, with me. And he says, I've come out something with the accident. It's called the potato plastic. And uh, have a look at it, uh, his own experience. Pontus Turquist, 
says his plastic bags are good enough to eat. He's made them out of potato starch and says they could help solve the growing problem of single-use plastic. It started out as a mistake, actually. Um, first, I wanted the building stone, the material, to be seaweed. So I went up to my hometown, collected some seaweed, and uh, dried it. And uh, I tried to find a binder for it. Uh, one of these binders was uh, potato starch and water. But uh, I spilled some of this fluid. And uh, later on, I saw that it had uh, dried to a plastic-like film. And I found it very interesting. Farms discard up to 20% of their potatoes for being ugly, and they get turned into starch. Turkvist added glycerol to the mix to give it flexibility. Plastic bags take hundreds of years to decompose. His bags break down in soil in two months. He's also made throwaway cutlery with a range of knives, forks, spoons, and cups. So as you can see, it's pretty durable. It works. I'm going to see if the fork works as well. It did. So these were the things that you, you are giving your inputs. You're getting a lot of um, reflections and outputs from the students. And you just continue to go further and further. And you start defining how to go beyond. And, and these were all these projects which kind of became um, my fuel to, to go further. And it's not only me, but I think it's for all of us involved in education. There's so much of give and take happening constantly. So that kind of, uh, uh, you know, sums up this whole thing. Like I, I was going through this whole definition of uh, design, what uh, World Design Organization uh, had put up uh, over the over several decades, and the, their latest one it talks about industrial design being a strategic design process, uh, problem solving process that drives innovation, builds business successes, and and leads to a better quality of life uh, through product systems and services, and uh, and of course, design industrial design is now turning to be a transdisciplinary profession, and it is going beyond just being at uh, at one uh, steady domain we are as designers we are able to do many new th things we are uh, but basically what we want to do is we we want to create fresh new experiences we want to uh, make the world better we want to make the businesses grow with us so that made me look at what world design organization was doing uh, to define the role of design and that was super interesting to to find out that in 1969 also they were talking about design being a creative activity and they were talking about embracing human environment back then but maybe no one was listening to them in in 2005 also they were talking about processes but they were at the same time talking about humanization and and many other things but in the last five ten years the focus became more and more on uh, um, uh, on what's possible, how can we make it uh, more uh, 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 like uh, problem solving, uh, reframing, re-questioning. And what you see in the purple side is actually what has happened to design uh, as a profession that from object uh, center design, it has gone into uh, defining new values and going beyond design. So that's what, uh, if you collect them all, so this is what are different areas in which designers uh, have been working and these areas keep on growing further and further. So maybe 10 years ago, these were the, the usual roles what a designer would say I, I'm able to do, like trying to be um, um, as uh, um, you know, diverse as possible. But uh, these um, uh, uh, qualities and these options kept on increasing and the, the role of designer kept on go, growing from one area to the other. Uh, but what should be uh, understood over here is that even though we are evolving new products, uh, we are trying to create timeless design. It's very important for us to make our design very sustainable. Uh, we have to look at um, uh, the ethics. We have to look at the, the impact on, on nature and uh, with that, I leave uh, this uh, kind of open-ended question for you, like 
what should we be doing as designers and how can our roles uh, take us uh, uh, beyond what we are doing today. So that's uh, where I am. And hopefully these turning points would again get redefined for me um, in the next few years. So thank you very much.